Hello, thanks for being here. Um, I am really excited to introduce Lillian Faderman. We're keeping it really casual. We're like sitting here like it's not a big deal that she's here, but it feels like a very big deal. Like I should be up on the podium with like a spotlight on her. And, um, when I was 22 years old and I first came out and I made my pilgrimage from New England to New York City Pride and I went to my first gay bookstore, which was Oscar Wilde, which I found out in your book was started by a lover of Harvey Milk's. Yes. Um, I found Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers sitting on the shelf and I was immediately drawn to it. And I didn't realize how badly I needed that book to sort of um, give me a historical context for myself and to understand who my ancestors were. And also to give me a heads up for, you know, what was coming down the pipe when I moved to San Francisco and fell into a butch femme, you know, revolution I learned about in your book from the 60s. So um, that was a really important book to me as, you know, many of your books have been. Um, Naked in the Promised Land is a stunning, incredible book that felt like a handshake through time between, like, them, sex worker, lesbian, radicals, I don't know. But um, with Harvey Milk, she has, um, it's her first foray into a full-on biography, like you were just saying, something you didn't know that you would ever do. And um, she presents him with all of his um, passions and flaws, and he becomes such a real human being. And for me, somebody who sort of m missed him um, in real life, and he's become I, more of a, an icon. It was been really wonderful to get to see him sort of more on a human level. So without further ado, Lillian Faderman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, well, Michelle. And thank you casual. for being here. So um, I, I first wrote about Harvey uh, about uh, 12 or 15 pages in my book, The Gay Revolution. I didn't uh, go into his Jewish background very much, although I, I uh, knew about it, of course. And I, I was particularly fascinated because uh, his grandfather, who was the first generation in America, came from a shtetl in Lithuania that was right on the border of Latvia. And my mother came from a shtetl in Latvia that was 30 kilometers from the border of Lithuania. So I've always wondered if maybe 200 years ago we were somehow related. So, um, <laughs> so Yale University Press, right after um, the gay revolution came out, asked if I would like to do a biography of Harvey Milk. It took me about 10 seconds to think about it and say yes. Of course, I, I wanted to, to do that. I, I knew that I would be concentrating on uh, Harvey as a gay activist and a politician, but I also wanted to look at how his Jewish background influenced him. And what I discovered is he had a very complex relationship to being Jewish. He, he would, um, uh, practically the first thing he would say in ma many instances when he introduced himself was the fact that he was a New York Jew. And he would never say Jewish, he would say Jew. Uh, it, it was just very direct and confrontational and not euphemistic. And Harvey was certainly not in any way a euphemistic guy. So that, that was uh, very much a part of his identity. But like many American Jews, he, uh, he was not at all religious. He really considered himself totally secular. And yet he, he loved Yiddishkeit. Um, I, I was told by a couple of people that I interviewed that he had his bar mitzvah picture hanging in Castro camera, not uh, as a, an indication that he had been pledged to the faith, but rather because it was his memory of his Jewish boyhood back in, in Long Island. He, he loved the sentimental things about being Jewish. He loved corned beef on rye, and he would talk all the time about how you couldn't get a decent corned beef on rye sandwich in San Francisco. He even thought in the beginning that that's the business that he and his lover Scott Smith would go into, that they would open a, a good delicatessen in San Francisco. He, he um, 
uh, he grew up in a family that uh, that spoke uh, Yiddish, not entirely, but often, uh, and he knew a lot of Yiddish phrases. And he would love it uh, if if he met someone who knew Yiddish and they could exchange phrases. I, I was told so many stories that I, I absolutely loved about that, but just one example, uh, a story uh, told to me by Anne Cronenberg, who was his aide, she said that um, there was a, an elderly Jewish woman by the name of Henrietta Abrams, who was one of Harvey's constituents. And uh, she, she just loved him. She would call him his little, her, her little Jewish prince. And she, um, she knew that he had a sweet tooth, so every week she would take a bus from, I think it was Cole Street to, uh, to City Hall, carrying a box of cookies that she made for her little Jewish prince. And he would usher her into the office and Anne said then they, he would close the door and she knew that they would munch cookies and uh, just uh, talk Yiddishkeit, just uh, throw in Yiddish phrases in their conversation. So, so he was Jewish in that way, but he was Jewish in much more important ways. And I, I think that uh, he, he took very seriously the the commandment to uh, repair the world, help repair the world, tikkun olam. Uh, and I, I think that, that that was crucial to his politics. So uh, let me start uh, the slideshow by showing you a picture of his grandfather, the, uh, the first milk in America, but his name was Mausha Milch, not Milk, uh, of course, milk in, milk in, in uh, Yiddish. Um, he was a dairy man in uh, Lithuania in his shtetl, like Tavir the, mil the milk Milchiker in uh, Shalom Aleichem's Fiddler on the Roof. Um, he, he came to America without his wife and five children because he couldn't afford to bring them here. And um, his story is, is uh, the American success story. So he, uh, he went to a stepbrother that he had in Kansas City and he kind of thought that he would uh, become a dairy man in Kansas and of course he couldn't afford to buy land which was much more expensive in Kansas than it was in in uh, his shtetl in Lithuania. And so he worked in the stepbrother's store uh, for a while, still couldn't make enough money to bring his wife and five children. And so he decided he would go to New York. Uh, the Lower East Side by that time was crowded with immigrants. And so instead of settling on the Lower East Side, he had an aunt on Long Island. She uh, said she, he, he could stay with her for a while. He got himself a peddler's pack, peddled around Long Island, uh, made enough money to open a little dry goods store, sent for his wife and five kids, including Harvey's father, who was six years old when he arrived. He was only six months old when Mausha left. And then Mausha made enough money to open the first department store. In, in their area of Long Island. They settled in Woodmere, Long Island, and he uh, eventually invested in real estate. He became quite wealthy. I think if he returned to Yoniskis, his shtetl, they would have thought he was a nobleman. And that, that so often happened, I think, with, with people who left their shtetlach and came to the States and, and uh, made good. So he became a, a philanthropist and uh, he became an activist as well. Uh, just as one instance, there was a, a, a country club uh, near Woodmere, the Rockaway Hunt Club, uh, and uh, people who were succeeding wanted to join a country club. It had been a very American thing to do since the 19th century. The only problem is the Rockaway Hunt Club wouldn't allow Jews, and so uh, Harvey's grandfather, Mausha, started the first Jewish country club in the area on Woodmere, Long Island. So, and, and he was, he, he started the, uh, or uh, co-founded, I should say, the first uh, synagogue in Woodmere, Long Island. He really, he, he did well and he did good too. Uh, and I think he became one of Harvey's main role models. His other role model 
was his mother, who was really a character. She's the one in the middle. This was taken at Knott's Berry Farm. <laughs> and she was, uh, Harvey said she was sort of a hippie before there were hippies, but she was also um, a philanthropist and also believed in tikkun olam. Uh, she died, in fact, at the age of 62 of a heart attack that she suffered after she uh, delivered a 24-pound turkey to a New York City settlement house so that uh, people who wouldn't have had a, a Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving turkey could have one. She uh, had a heart attack, languished in the hospital for five days, and died on November 27, 1962, to the day exactly uh, 14 years uh, before, uh, I'm sorry, 18 years before her son died, um, 16 years before her son died. Something wrong with my math here. Harvey died in, in 78, she died in 62. Um, and then there was the father. Uh, this is uh, Bill Milk, very different from his father, Mausha, and also very different from, uh, from Harvey. But he too um, had a social conscience. Just one story I'll tell you. When Harvey was about uh, 10 years old, um, the Woodmere School District wanted to hire a music teacher and a Jewish woman applied and they refused to hire a Jew. And uh, Harvey's father, along with another, uh, several other Jews in the community, went to them and argued long enough to make them change their minds. So they, they uh, finally hired that, that teacher. Harvey's um, ethnic identity as a Jew was, was uh, very firm throughout his, his childhood and throughout his youth. He, he went to Haider, he had a bar mitzvah, but he, um, uh, that was sort of the end of religion for him, at least almost until his death. And the reason it, it was is that he figured out when he was 14 that he was gay. And he really felt that there was no synagogue at that time in the 1940s that would welcome a gay person. And so he, he uh, as soon as he didn't have to go to a synagogue anymore, he, uh, he didn't. Um, and yet that, that Jewish identity remained. In, uh, in college, he joined a Jewish fraternity. Um, he uh, joined Hillel. He went to Sabbath dinners and other uh, Jewish holidays and celebrations at Hillel. He went to college, uh, started in 1947. He was a Zionist. He joined the uh, Intercollegiate Zionist Federation of America. And he proclaimed his Jewish identity every chance he got. Just um, one story I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, at one point, he, he came back to um, Long Island for uh, Christmas break, as it was called then. He came back from college. Um, and uh, he had a, a best friend in high school who was uh, Roman Catholic. And he went to visit his friend, and they were hanging Christmas lights. And Harvey said, oh, let me help you with that. And so they gave him a section of lights to hang, and they weren't watching what he was doing. And he, um, he formed those lights into a twinkling star of David that he then <laughs> hung up. So it, it was, uh, he, was, he always announced his, his uh, Jewishness. He was very aware of anti-Semitism. Um, as he was growing up on Woodmere, Long Island in the 1930s and the early 40s, there was a Nazi organization called the German American Bund that had huge rallies on Long Island. There was no way that he could not have been aware of it because his parents were so aware of it. Um, six days before his bar mitzvah in 1943, the Warsaw Ghetto fell. He heard about that from his parents. And as an adult, even in San Francisco, he told people that 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 taught him a lesson, that his parents said, when something so evil descends on you, you have to fight as the ghetto fighters did, even if it's hopeless. And I, I think that, that that just became so much a part of his character, that you have to fight against the horrors of injustice, even if it seems hopeless. The Holocaust became a major 
metaphor in his speeches. And I, I ran across so many of his speeches in which he uses the Holocaust as an example and a warning to gay people to what could happen if you're not vigilant, if you don't start fighting in the beginning. He, he was um, very uh, active in uh, the battle against Proposition uh, 6, uh, which was the, uh, the Briggs Initiative, uh, which said that if you were uh, homosexual or if you said anything nice about homosexuals, you could not teach in the public schools. And in his speeches about uh, how it's important to defeat Proposition 6, he would uh, keep returning <laughs> to the Holocaust as a metaphor and a simile and an example. Uh, in one speech, just to give you one instance, he said, just as Proposition 6 would prevent gay people from teaching in the public schools, so 45 years ago did the German law prohibit Jews from teaching or holding any other civil service position. So that, that, that was his major metaphor, and it was always on his mind. So in 1973, he, uh, he first ran for office, and this is the way he looked uh, in his uh, first run. Uh, he was very aware of himself, even then, as part of an ultra-liberal Jewish uh, tradition that fought for all of the oppressed. In his speeches, he made it clear that he was a champion not only of gay people, but also of workers and uh, racial and ethnic minorities and the disabled and senior citizens and everyone who suffered discrimination. Sometimes he, he would say, and he, he said it sort of wryly, that uh, we Jews know that uh, we can't allow discrimination if for no other reason than we will someday be on that list. So uh, again, he learned from, from the uh, story of the Holocaust. He, um, it, he was always aware of himself as a double outsider, not only as a gay person, but also as a Jew. And he never let go of those sympathies for the outsider. Just a, a couple of instances. Um, early in, in uh, his run, he was asked to fill out a questionnaire for a group that was doing a voter pamphlet. And uh, he wrote on the questionnaire that, that the government uh, wasted taxpayers' money uh, by hiring police to arrest people for victimless crimes, and that same money had to go to things such as expanding health care for the elderly and the poor. It had to go to expanding Operation Bootstrap for, uh, so that minorities and young people could uh, be helped to start businesses. It had to go to help hard drug addicts uh, uh, get well again instead of throwing them into prison. Uh, he was asked one question on that questionnaire about uh, civil rights, and he said, quote, for all, especially gay, especially black, especially Mexican, especially oriental. So his point was that he was not simply a gay candidate, but he was a candidate that was going to fight for all those who were discriminated against. So he lost the, um, the first race for supervisors. I, I think uh, San Francisco just wasn't ready for this guy with a New York accent who uh, had just barely come to San Francisco, he'd only been here for a year, um, who looked uh, quite a bit like a hippie. He had long hair, He's, he tied it in this picture back in a, a ponytail. Um, but he, he realized that um, he had to change his style if he was going to run again. <laughs> what a metamorphosis. <laughs> this was in, in um, uh, 1975 when he ran again for office. But he made it clear that although his style had changed, his values had not changed. This time, he, he was really much more savvy in uh, getting endorsements. He managed to get endorsements from uh, organized labor. Uh, in this slide here, you see him speaking to uh, the longshoremen in San Francisco. He got endorsements from them. I, I, I'm always so fascinated by this slide, how seriously and intently they look at him, and they're really listening to him here. He really understood how to come across to organized labor. 
he, um, he got endorsements from ecologists for the San Francisco Tomorrow Club. He got endorsements from various uh, African-American groups called black groups in those days, uh, Latino groups, uh, Asian groups. He really appealed to, um, to senior citizens. Um, here he is talking to a group of senior citizens, and he got endorsements from them. They, they loved his promise that he would stop the police from uh, uh, harassing innocent people who were not uh, bothering anyone else. Uh, they were victimless crimes, that is, gay people, and that money would go towards uh, helping senior citizens, uh, improving health care in, in San Francisco. So he barely lost that election. There were six seats and, uh, open, and he came in seventh. And that gave him courage to run again. So he ran again in 1976 for the assembly. He lost that, too. Three strikes, but he was definitely not out. Uh, in 1977, uh, the uh, procedure for electing supervisors in San Francisco had changed. Before, it was a citywide election. In 1977, it became a district election. He ran in a district that included the Castro and Haight-Ashbury and Noe Valley and places that already knew him and loved him. And he won. He, he was a shoe-in. So in this picture, you see him with Mayor George Moscone. They're clearly having a, a one wonderful time. I believe this picture was taken just about the time when Moscone signed the gay rights bill into law. Um, Harvey was in office uh, for only 11 months. And uh, in November of that year, he took office in January of 78. In November of 78, he was killed by a homophobic fellow supervisor, Dan White. So why he was only serving in office 11 months, as I said. He's been dead for 40 years. Why does he still matter? I don't think it's just the drama of his martyrdom. I think he matters also because of the important things he did. This is Harvey on the Board of Supervisors. You can see from the stack of papers on every desk how much work there was for the supervisors to do. He, I think he did a lot of what can be described as repairing the world in those 11 months. On a local level, he fought for rent control. Um, he fought against the expansion of the San Francisco airport because he thought that more traffic uh, would come about if the airport would be expanded, more pollution, more noise. It's really ironic that, as I'm sure you all know, a terminal has been named after him. I don't know what he would have thought about that one. <laughs> <laughs> he, he accomplished a lot, too, that resonated far beyond San Francisco. For example, he fought for the uh, U.S. State Department to close its South African consulate in San Francisco in protest against South African apartheid. And he got the Board of Supervisors to vote that the city would not do business with banks and corporations that did business with South Africa as long as apartheid existed. South uh, San Francisco was the first city, and this started a municipal movement. By uh, 1990, 112 cities and counties around the United States had divested from South Africa until uh, the apartheid policy was no more. Of course, he was especially important to the gay uh, community. He got the Board of Supervisor to pass the country's most uh, comprehensive, most exhaustive gay rights bill at a time when other cities were repealing their bills. Some of you may be old enough to remember Anita Bryant and the damage that she did in, in uh, Miami. Their gay rights ordinance was repealed there in St. Paul, Minnesota, and Wichita, Kansas, and Eugene, Oregon. San Francisco passed this very strong bill that also had teeth in it that said that, that 
people had a right to sue if they were discriminated against on the basis of their sexual orientation. And then he, he did uh, other things that I think was vital for our progress as an LGBT community, as we call ourselves now. In those days, we were a gay and lesbian community. Um, but Harvey really believed that um, gay adults had to take moral responsibility for gay youth. This was unheard of in the 1970s. The, the existing organizations from the beginning, organizations such as Mattachine and Daughters of Belitis, and then uh, the Society for Individual Rights and other organizations that cropped up through the years, they all had a, a no one under 21 policy. You couldn't even subscribe to their magazines. And these were not pornographic magazines. These were magazines about how homosexuals had to fight for civil rights. But if you were under 21, you couldn't subscribe. The reason for that, I, I think, is obvious, because one of the things that, that society leveled against us for so many years was the, the uh, crazy bugaboo, the stereotype that uh, homosexuals are people who lurk in the shadows ready to pounce on some 14-year-old kid. And, and because of that, these homosexual organizations really felt obliged to have a no one under 21 policy. Harvey said there are more important things to worry about. Don't worry about these dumb accusations. We have to help young people who get thrown out of their house because they're gay, who can't find a job because they're gay. When he said that, he was the first elected politician ever in the history of this country to have said something like that, that gay youth have to be helped. Now it's obvious. Now all gay organizations, all LGBTQ organizations understand that. Uh, there isn't a gay center in the country that doesn't have a program for LGBTQ youth. Uh, even organizations as, as relatively conservative as the Human Human Rights Campaign concerns itself with the welfare of LGBTQ youth. But Harvey was the first to make that point. So um, the last year of, of Harvey's life uh, was glorious because he, he was just uh, such a force on the Board of Supervisors. But it was also a very difficult here. It, it, it was uh, in several ways really terrible. He, he had wonderful victories, but he also had real tragedies that last year. One was the fact that uh, he was constantly broke. He couldn't pay his bills. The Board of Supervisors position was a half-time position. Um, it it uh, was taken usually by people who, uh, like Carol Ruth Silver, who was a lawyer, she uh, had a law practice while she was on the Board of Supervisors, or Diane Feinstein, who had a very wealthy husband. Uh, but it was virtually impossible to live on a half salary. It was $9,600 a year. In those days, even, it would have been uh, the poverty uh, on the poverty line. And then he, he had put so much of his money into the four campaigns and uh, put all of his time and energy into those campaigns. And so Castro Camera sort of went down the hill and finally it closed. So he couldn't get any income out of Castro Camera. Um, he, he had to borrow money from friends. When he died, he actually had a check in his pocket for $3,000 that a friend had lent him so he could pay his rent and eat that month and put a little bit into paying back his, his debt. But that wasn't the worst of the tragedies. The worst of the tragedies was that in August, uh, Jack Lira, the man that he uh, had lived with for a couple of years, committed suicide and uh, left really gruesome uh, suicide notes. And so maybe it was the accumulation of, of those uh, terrible things that drove Harvey astonishingly to a synagogue for the high holidays, probably for the first time uh, since he left his parents' home. He went to the uh, gay synagogue in San Francisco, Shahar Zahav, 
Um, and the the rabbi at that synagogue later said he, he went there for both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And the rabbi uh, who officiated later said that after the service uh, on Yom Kippur, Harvey went up to him and, and uh, thanked him and said how good it was to finally be home with his Jewishness. But I'm, I'm going to end my presentation by saying that in terms of what Harvey stood for and how well he understood the notion of tikkun olam, I think he never stopped being at home with his Jewishness. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, Luke is so good. Don't you just want to live in her living room and have her talk to you about life every night? before bed. Um, can you talk about what your process was like? I'm so curious um, how you amassed all of these personal anecdotes and these wonderful details that really brought him alive in the yeah. book. The, the first thing I, I did is there, there is a, a several fabulous Harvey Milk collections right here in San Francisco at the San Francisco Public Library in the History Room. Uh, and I worked with all of them. Uh, there's the Harvey Milk Archive, Scott Smith collection. Uh, Scott Smith was, uh, he was the person who was the most important in Harvey's life. Harvey lived with him and started Castro Camera with him. They uh, broke up a few years before Harvey's death, uh, partly because uh, Harvey was so involved in running for politics and Scott just got fed up with Harvey being constantly out campaigning that uh, Scott couldn't stand it anymore. But they loved each other uh, for the rest of Harvey's life. Um, in any case, Scott uh, inherited all of Harvey's papers. Scott uh, died of AIDS. So Scott's mother inherited the papers, and his mother uh, wonderfully gave those papers, all of those papers, to the uh, San Francisco Public Library, Harvey Milk Archive, Scott Smith Collection. Uh, Randy Schiltz did a, a terrific book on Harvey Milk in 1982. Uh, and he had done voluminous interviews with people who are no longer alive. He only used a tiny fraction of those interviews in his book. And I got to go through all of those interviews. And I, I, I was able to really fill in a lot of gaps through the interviews and material that he didn't use. Um, there's another very important collection by Mike Weiss, who uh, wrote a book about uh, Dan White and the double murders at City Hall. And Mike Weiss uh, did interviews with people who were alive then and are no longer alive. And he gave me permission to uh, look through all of those interviews. And I found invaluable material there. And then I, uh, I interviewed a number of people who graciously gave me their time, people who were close to Harvey, like uh, Cleve Jones and uh, Danny Nicoletta, who worked in the store, and Anne Cronenberg, who was uh, Harvey's aide, um, and Tom Amiano, who uh, was very inspired by Harvey to run for politics himself. Um, and then I found several family members who were really helpful. Um, there, there was one family member, a man by the name of uh, uh, Sam Mandela, whose mother was uh, Harvey's aunt, and she saw herself as the uh, repository of the history. And so it was from uh, Sam, the mother's no longer alive, but it was from Sam that I got some wonderful photographs, uh, such as the picture of Mausha Milch, the grandfather, that um, I don't think anyone outside of the family had ever seen before. So I was thrilled to get that. Uh, I interviewed a number of other family members, such as uh, Michael Salem, uh, who was uh, a second cousin to Harvey, who uh, is famous in his own right, but he said that it was Harvey who really gave him good business advice. Uh, Michael's uh, father had had a, uh, a store in New York. Uh, he called himself Hosier to the Stars, 
uh, and he he sold stockings to people like Greta Garbo and uh, uh, just you know all sorts of uh, uh, luminaries of the era. And then women stopped wearing stockings, and he sort of went out of business. But Michael took over the um, uh, the business, and he noticed that um, a lot of his orders were from for these huge sizes, and he didn't think women. <laughs> and of course, they were uh, people who were called in those days female impersonators. And he thought this would be a great business. It's kind of like the kinky boots story. Are, are you all familiar with that? Uh, so Michael um, uh, did that for many years. He just recently retired. But he said that Harvey was the one who gave him business advice about how to advertise and, and really uh, set him up. So I, I was fortunate to be able to do about 50 interviews uh, with people who knew Harvey, people who were just customers in Harvey's store. Um, uh, several family members, and that was my process. Oh, great. Um, what does his, his family, how do they regard him? Like, do they understand that he's this huge legacy, and what do they think of that? Yeah, the people I interviewed all understand that he's this huge legacy. Um, he, uh, he had a very contentious relationship with his brother. Um, I, I was told by uh, someone very close to Harvey at the time that uh, uh, when Harvey ran for office, he asked his brother if he would uh, help fund the campaign. And his brother said, are, are you kidding? Hell no, and hung up on him. So that that was the end of that. And um, Harvey wrote the brother out of his will specifically. There's a cause, a clause saying that nothing is to go to the brother who's no longer alive, of course. But um, I, I don't think the brother understood uh, who Harvey was. Uh, when, when Harvey announced that he was running, uh, apparently the brother said to other family members, and the brother admitted that to the newspapers after Harvey's death, that's just Harvey being Harvey again, meaning that somebody who wants the limelight and uh, couldn't take him seriously. But the family members that I interviewed, um, I, I don't know if they understood at the time how mm -hmm. important he was, but they certainly do see him as, as a, a figure to be very proud of, and they are very proud of him. He never came out to his parents. I think his mother probably knew. Um, I was told that she uh, knitted matching Afghans for him and Joe Campbell, who was his lover in the 1960s. They lived together, never talked about it though, and then she died in 1962. His father didn't know. He had a difficult relationship with his father. His father lived until 1976, and of course Harvey's name was in the newspapers because he was one of the first out uh, gay male candidates uh, in the country. Uh, but by that time, the father was blind and wasn't reading newspapers, so the father never read about it. But um, after the father's death, I think Harvey really understood that, that he, Harvey lost something by not telling his parents who he really was. He, he never had a close relationship with his father because he had to hide something. And so one of Harvey's major messages was that we have to come out. If we're lesbian or gay, he said we have to come out to everyone. He specified to not only our parents, but our, our siblings and all our family members and our neighbors and people where we work and people uh, who are the wait staff at the restaurants where we eat. And, and he was so right about that. And now most of us have come out. And because of that, I think public opinion has really changed. You can't think that a homosexual is someone who lurks in the shadows, ready to pounce on a 14-year-old if it's your son or your daughter or, or your beloved neighbor or your fellow employee that you like so much. So it's, it's been vital. And he understood that. that. That became his major message in the couple of years that he survived after his father died. Um, because I know Harvey Milk's political, I know him as a politician, as an activist, um, I was really struck reading that like that chapter of his life came kind of later, like he had had this full life doing all kinds of other things before yes. he even 
kind of got the idea to run for oh, office, yes. which seemed yeah. at the time almost like almost like a whimsical idea. Yeah. The the subtitle of my book is The Lives and <laughs> Death of Harvey Milk or Harvey Milk his Lives and Death. Um <laughs> I, uh, people sometimes, if, if they're writing about it, they, they say, don't you mean life? But no, it, it's lives because he had so many different metamorphoses. He was a jock in college um, in the Navy. He was a deep sea dry diver and he uh, then trained uh, naval deep sea divers. Uh, he got out and he became a high school teacher. And I, uh, I, I do several different kinds of presentations. In another presentation, I have a picture of him in the uh, yearbook of the high school where he taught. He is so buttoned down with his hair just slicked down in a very <laughs> tight tie and, and this tight uh, suit. Um, and then um, he, he didn't like that very much. Uh, he went to Texas to try to make his fortune. I have a great picture of him in Texas wearing jeans and a, a, an open collar shirt and looking very casual, but so different from the way he looked when he was uh, a teacher. Uh, couldn't make his fortune in Texas, came back to New York, worked on Wall Street as a securities analyst and again looked very different from his other presentations and then he fell in love with a young man who um, was a stage manager for little theater and hung around with a hippie crowd and harvey became a hippie with a uh, very long hair and a huge mustache and um, uh, smoked pot a lot in in those days um, and then he, uh, he became involved in the theater. He was actually an associate producer for one play on Broadway. Um, he worked with uh, Tom O'Horgan, who was the uh, director of Hair uh, and Jesus Christ Superstar. So he had a, a whole Broadway career looking very much like a hippie. Then he came to San Francisco, didn't know what he would do, opened up the small business with his lover at the time, Scott Smith, opened Castro Camera. Um, and then um, the, uh, the Watergate hearings happened and he absolutely hated Nixon, thought Nixon was a crook from the beginning. Uh, Harvey wasn't so interested in being a businessman, so they lived upstairs from Castro Camera. They had a little TV set upstairs. Every morning he would lug the TV set downstairs to Castro Camera, put it on a chair, sit opposite the chair, and all day long he would listen to the Watergate hear uh, hearings. And Scott Smith said that people would come into the store, they would see this guy with long hair, dark circles under his eyes, staring at the television set, screaming at uh, John Mitchell and uh, John Dean, uh, you lying uh, blank blank son of a bitch and <laughs> at the top of his lungs. So that, that happened and that made him think that maybe he needed to go into politics. But a few other things happened. Um, one was that uh, a teacher came to the store, an elementary school teacher, and she said she wanted to rent a slide projector because she wanted to show her students some slides. And Harvey said, you mean to tell me your school doesn't have any projectors? And she said, well, yes, we have a couple, but you have to uh, put your name on a list at least a month in advance because there are only two projectors for the whole school. And Harvey was furious with that. He, he said more money has to go to the school so that teachers could uh, have a projector to show their kids slides when they wanted to. And so that, that was something else that happened in 1973 that made him decide he wanted to run for office. So it wasn't exactly on a whim, but... Right. Um, I think he also, um, and this is not to diminish who he was and what he did. I think all politicians have to have something of what I'm about to say in them. He, he loved the limelight. There's a story that his brother actually uh, told that I, I thought really gave me an insight into one little aspect of Harvey. 
When Harvey was eight or nine years old, he really liked to go to the Woodmere Movie Theater for the Saturday matinees. And it wasn't the Three Stooges that he liked. It was the fact that the uh, manager of the theater before the movie started would have a raffle um, for the kids. And the kid who had the winning ticket got to uh, run up on stage and bow and mug. And uh, Harvey just lived to have the winning ticket, not for the Dick Tracy wristwatch, but just to get to that stage to bow and mug. And I think for his brother, that, that really explained who Harvey was. Well, he was much more complicated than that, but, but there was that element in him always. He loved the stage. He, he loved being an actor as he was very briefly. He was so comfortable with audiences. He, he, he had a charisma. He had stage presence. But that, that was certainly part of who he was, too. Um, I was struck also by his sort of the progression of his politics and the way that they sort of morphed, that he started out as <laughs> sort of like crazed libertarian, like. Yes, and exactly. Then, yeah. He was a Goldwater supporter in 1964. <laughs> But it, it wasn't uh, uh, the, the aspects of Goldwater, uh, like not uh, uh, wanting money to go into health care or whatever that he liked. It was that Goldwater was truly a libertarian. And Goldwater said that the government had no right in people's bedrooms. And Harvey liked that. The, the term libertarian hadn't been invented yet. It's, it uh, wasn't a term until the early 1970s. But those were the politics that Harvey really appreciated. And uh, Goldwater continued to say wonderful things about uh, how the government had no business snooping into people's bedrooms. When there was a question uh, about uh, uh, homosexuals, I guess Goldwater would have said, serving in the military, uh, Goldwater's response was, I don't care if they are straight, I just care if they shoot straight, which was a you know, wonderful libertarian response. So that's what, that's what Harvey liked about uh, Goldwater. Mm -hmm. he, he hid that part of his history when he uh, became a politician, but nevertheless, it was true. He was a, a Goldwater supporter in 1964. Um, I imagine he would be really shocked at what San Francisco looks like today because he was yes. so anti-development yes. really yes. way back before. Yes. Would yes. you speak a little bit to, to yes. that? He, was, yeah. he had a really strong yes. sort of class consciousness. Yes, to... yes. his, his um, love for San Francisco was the fact that, that San Francisco was made up of neighborhoods and and they were uh, small neighborhoods. They were real communities. And one of the things that he uh, su was suspicious about uh, Di Diane Feinstein about is that he thought, and he accused her of being in the pocket of the real estate developers. He, he really was opposed to development, opposed. One of the first things he did on the Board of Supervisors is vote against um, this uh, proposition to expand the airport, as I mentioned. In fact, it, it was, I, I believe it was his very first vote on the Board of Supervisors. And he hadn't yet figured out how you have to be able to count to six. There were 11 people on the Board of Supervisors. So he got two other people to vote with him. And of course, they lost. And the San Francisco airport expanded and expanded and expanded and continues to expand. And now has a terminal named after him. So funny. It's San Francisco always like liberal politicians look really conservative here, you know, <laughs> and because it's such a radical city, right. um, yes. which is something that's so great about it. Um, I. I think a lot about how individuals who experience racial and ethnic oppression and violence um, often have their family of origin to sort of catch them and sort of validate what they're going through and like create a framework for oppression that like, yeah, there is racism, there's, there's anti-Semitism, there's people out in the world that like, you know, work against us and here's what we have to do. And that queer people generally don't have that. We're, yes. And the family is often a source yes. of that oppression. So yes. I was wondering how, yes. um, growing up in the household where he had to be like hipped to oppression helped him as a gay man like yeah. be so out during yeah. that time period yeah he he didn't uh, 
as I said earlier, of course, he couldn't confide in his family. He realized that, that he was gay by the time he was 14. He had his first sexual experiences at the age of 14, as he talked about very openly. And what he wrote later on is that as soon as he understood he was gay, home was never home again to me. And he, he really um, had to find a home, and he felt that he found it in San Francisco. He found it in, in the Castro. I think that, that he, he was so determined to help create gay community here, not just a place where gay people could gather in the Castro, but a real community that had real power and uh, really had rights because he felt he had no community back home. Mm -hmm. So this, this became his community. And I think his experience of, of uh, not only Jewish discrimination, but gay oppression back home made him particularly sensitive to how important it was to, to help create community. Mm -hmm. um, I was, it was disheartening but familiar to read about all the, um, the queer infighting that happened around yes. Harvey Milk. I had no idea. Yes. Gays hated Harvey Milk. Yes. <laughs> I thought gays only loved Harvey Milk, well, but in fact... Some, some hated Harvey yeah, Milk. Yeah, yeah. What, what happened is that, um, so he, he came here in 1972, and in 1973 he decided he would run for the Board of Supervisors. So there was uh, a club in San Francisco called the Alice B. Toklas Memorial Democratic Club, which was a gay and lesbian um, democratic club that would support gay-friendly candidates. They uh, supported Diane Feinstein, who was gay-friendly from the beginning. She, she was the first politician that actually went to a gay organization, to the Society for the for individual rights to ask for their support in 1969, and she got it. So she was very gay friendly. Um, but um, th they supported George Moscone, the Alice B. Toklas Club. They supported Willie Brown, and uh, they supported the Burtons, Phil and John Burton, gay friendly politicians. So Harvey comes to uh, to Jim Foster who was a um, very um, conservative-looking gay man who was the head of the uh, Alice B. Toklas Club and says, I'm running for supervisor and I would like your support. And so Harvey still looks like a hippie, long hair, not tied back in a ponytail at that time, but just long and a great big mustache and wearing denims. And here's uh, Jim Foster in a suit and tie. And Jim Foster said that he looked at this guy with a New York accent and looking as he looked, and he thought to himself, who is this Mr. Yo-Yo? Uh, and what he said to Harvey, um, because Harvey had not been active in the gay community, he just arrived the year before, what he said to Harvey is that uh, we have a saying in the Demo uh, uh, democratic uh, 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 societies here, you don't get to dance unless you put up the chairs. I've never seen you putting up the chairs. And Harvey still didn't get it. He said, I, but I, I'm gonna support the gay community. And uh, Jim Foster said, we're like the uh, Catholic Church. We accept converts, but we don't make them Pope the next day. <laughs> so he was just not going to bend. And the Alice B. Toklas Memorial Democratic Club really worked against him and did some nasty things. I, I got some stories from members of the uh, Alice Club uh, uh, one of them told me a story gleefully, and he didn't seem particularly contrite even to this date. <laughs> but his story was that um, when Harvey ran, um, uh, I, I think it was for the uh, 76 election for assembly, um, he, he had his helpers go around to the residences 
in the Castro district and other areas like the uh, Haight-Ashbury, do it at, at 1 a.m. before the bars closed at 2 and hang up uh, these door hangers on people's signs that said Harvey Milk for assembly. And this guy who'd been a member of the Alice Club told me that at 1.30, Alice Club members went around to all of the same houses and took the door hangers off because they were just so opposed to Harvey's running for office. Um, they, they did other uh, terrible things. I interviewed Elaine Noble, who was actually the first um, out uh, person to uh, win public office in 1974. Elaine Noble became uh, uh, one office for the Massachusetts, uh, 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 rep she was a state representative in Massachusetts. Um, so she was invited to San Francisco by the Alice Club. Um, uh, didn't know exactly why she was invited, but she was running again, and they said they would support her, and they would have a fundraiser in San Francisco for her. A lesbian group would have a fundraiser. So she came. Um, Jim Foster, this was in 76, Jim Foster, um, who knew her, uh, said, let me take you to lunch tomorrow. Uh, he picked her up the next day, and he said, do you mind if we stop by? I want you to meet this really nice guy. Took her to Art Agnos's office. Art Agnos was running against Harvey for the assembly. Um, Jim Foster had his camera with him. Uh, Elaine Noble shook hands with Art Agnos, Jim Foster took a picture of it. Afterwards, Jim Foster said, when they were in the car going to lunch, said to Elaine Noble, so do you like him, Art Agnos? And Elaine said, yeah, he's a nice guy. And a few days later, there was this big ad in uh, the San Francisco Gay Papers, a picture of Elaine Noble shaking hands with Art Agnos, and it said that she endorsed him over Harvey Milk, it's just a nasty trick like that. Elaine Noble, whom I interviewed, said that she was so upset and was going to protest, and uh, Kevin White, who was the mayor in Boston where she lived, said it would make it even worse if she protested, and so she didn't. But my, my point is that that was how much uh, the parts of the gay community did not like Harvey. They just, they simply didn't trust him because they saw him as a newcomer. Even though uh, in 1973, it's true, he hadn't yet put up the chairs, but by 1977, he put up every chair in sight. He really worked hard to win the trust of the gay community. And he did win the trust of most of the gay mm -hmm. community, but never of the Alice Club. Mm. Um, I wanna open it up to questions that you guys might have out here, yeah? Uh, in the 60s, there, there was no organized relationship. By the 70s, there was. Uh, uh, by the 70s, by the early 70s, these uh, uh, gay synagogues began to emerge, one in San Francisco. I think uh, Zahar, uh, 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 Zahav started in 1974, I believe. Uh, 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 Beth Simcha Torah started in New York in the early 1970s, and so there was a concerted effort uh, to make the Jewish community more sympathetic to the gay community. Uh, now, of course, there uh, there's there's sympathy in the Reformed synagogue and the uh, conservative synagogue. I think it's even threatening the gay synagogues because uh, gay people are so welcome in, in uh, almost all synagogues except perhaps the ultra-Orthodox synagogues. Um, but Harvey felt, other than, uh, of course, he knew about Shahar Zahav, and as I said, he, he went in 1978. But I, I think he felt alienated because growing up, it seemed to him that uh, he would be welcome at no synagogue. At one point, he, he said, he, he told an interesting story that I, I found uh, in the, uh, his papers in the San Francisco Public Library, and that is that um, 
when, when he was a teenager, he was very confused because he knew he was gay. And surprisingly, he went to a rabbi to, uh, to say that he, he was just really confused about his sexual orientation. And he said, and who knows what the rabbi really said, but what he remembered, he then uh, told a reporter, was that the rabbi said, um, as long as you live your life well and don't hurt other people, you should live it the way you need to live it. And if there are people that don't understand, if they're prejudiced, you have to have Rachmanis on, on them. And he used that Yiddish word, you have to have Rachmanis on them. And he explained to the reporter what that word meant. But then he told the reporter about his memory of this rabbi. He said, it almost made me want to go back to the synagogue again, but then I learned that he was a rare bird. Um, so you know, he, he remained hostile to organized religion, except for that visit and just before his death to the gay synagogue in, in San Francisco. I, I think now uh, things have changed so much. Um, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I think this is the first time I've said it in public. I'm going to have a bat mitzvah at my ripe old age. Oh, that's so wonderful. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so my, we moved to San Diego two years ago, my partner and I. And so we've been uh, checking out synagogues. Uh, and we've been to about a half dozen in the San Diego area. And they're, they're all so open to the LGBTQ community now. We've been uh, to reform synagogues and reconstructionist synagogues, but also to a wonderful conservative synagogue. And the rabbi there was just so, he, he knows who I am, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually uh, curating an LGBTQ exhibit in, in San Diego, and he wants to support the exhibit. Uh, uh, this is a conservative rabbi, but but so open, and that that's been my experience. One other story I have to tell you about that. So I I I, uh, uh, I, I told you that Harvey's grandfather helped found the first synagogue on Long Island. It's called Congregation. Uh, I'm sorry, in Woodmere, Long Island. It's called Congregation Sons of Israel, and um, I wanted to go there and uh, at least take a look at the synagogue where Harvey was uh, bar mitzvahed. So I contacted the rabbi and I got a little nervous uh, when um, the uh, online site said that uh, it was an Orthodox synagogue, a modern Orthodox synagogue. But I, I told the rabbi that I was uh, doing the book on Harvey Milk and of course he knew who Harvey was and he knew who the grandfather was. And he was just so welcoming and so open. And this was an Orthodox synagogue. So I think some Orthodox synagogues certainly are, are coming around. So Harvey would be thrilled to know that. But it wasn't the case when, uh, when Harvey was alive that so many uh, synagogues are now so open to LGBTQ people. There's a question back here. I have both a comment and a question. So my comment is my own memory, since I'm old enough to have been here in those early days with Harvey Milk and Jim Foster and Sir, was that there was another difference. And that was there was a long period when for gay men and lesbians, the idea was to conform as much as possible yes to not stand out, yes. to be as acceptable as possible. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's a very important point, yes. And Harvey, and by, Harvey the didn't. <laughs> by the time he got here, he had done that. So he was not too eager to redo that again. But my question is the following. One of the things that very much impressed me was when Harvey and Sally Gerhardt went out again to speak to communities about the Briggs Initiative. And I just was wondering if you would say one or two words about their relationship, because it was very important that here yes. was a gay man and a woman who I think was actually a minister. Uh, she and, was a professor, but she uh, had studied to be a minister. That's right. She was a professor at San Diego and State. And she became visible as a lesbian as well. Yes. So the two of them together would create 
maybe a kind of united front. Yes. And I thought that was very impressive. Yes, yes. Um, I, I was very upset that the wonderful movie Milk left Sally Gearhart out. I, I interviewed Sally several years ago, and she told me wonderful stories about working with Harvey. Um, if, if you're old enough and you remember the Briggs Initiative, that Proposition 6 that I talked about, you probably saw the debate uh, with Sally Gearhart Harvey Milk on one side and on the other, uh, John Briggs and a truly creepy minister from Pomona, California, by the name of Ray Batima. There, there was no question who won that debate. And Harvey was wonderful as always, and Sally was wonderful. But Sally Gearhart told me too that when, when they spoke on stages, Harvey would so often, after they spoke, lift her arm and say to the audience, our next supervisor. Um, and that, that was just so thrilling, I think, particularly for lesbians, because he was tacitly promising that he would help a lesbian feminist get elected to, uh, uh, to the board of supervisors. Of course, that didn't happen because he was killed before he could do that. She told me another story that I, I loved. Um, so they, they both dressed very conservatively. Um, this was already 1978. Uh, and Sally is a, a very uh, majestic woman. I understand she's having serious health problems now. A very majestic woman who really knew how to make a beautiful appearance. And Harvey, of course, would uh, look much like he looks in that uh, picture on the cover of the book. Um, and they liked to laugh that uh, they presented themselves as the mom and pop of the gay movement. But she uh, told me that one day they were scheduled to uh, speak at some auditorium. And uh, just before she was leaving the house to meet Harvey, he called her and he said, oh, my dear, I have lost my earrings. Whatever shall I do? But it was just, just that kind of campy thing that he, he absolutely love to do. Uh, but yes, they were a wonderful team, and it truly was terrible that she was left out of the movie. Mm. We have a question over here. I find it so powerful that you got to write this story because I feel that so much of your own life resembles and parallels Harvey's in that, as you spoke about your ancestors, but also your journey from New York to California, your journey as um, an activist and a trailblazer within the gay rights and the women rights movement. And how did it feel growing up within a similar time period of some sorts and going through the movement at the same time as Harvey was in your own right and in your own um, circle and then writing this story and looking back at your own history and moving through it? Yeah. That's a very large question, but to whatever you can say to it. Yeah, yeah I, um, I really felt myself to be an activist mostly through my writing. Um, and my writing became so important to me because I, I actually came out as a lesbian, uh, as a teenager, uh, with a phony ID in the lesbian bar culture in 1956 in Los Angeles at a bar called The Open Door. Um, and, and that was the way I was introduced to gay girls' culture, as we called ourselves then. And I, I, I really thought then that nobody had ever been like us before, that we were inventing it, that this was just the beginning. And I was a literary kid, so when I realized I was a lesbian, I, I, of course, one of the first things I did was I went to the library to see what I could find about lesbians. And I, I found um, Ricard von Kraft Ebbing, Psychopathia Sexualis, uh, where we were all uh, sick. Um, I found Havelock Ellis, which is just as bad. Um, and then I found the pulps which I loved, actually. You, 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 I'm sure most of you are much too young to uh, know about the uh, pulps, except maybe through, uh, there was a wonderful film about the lesbian pulps of the 1950s and 60s. You could find them for 25 cents on book racks, paperback, 
novels of drugstores, and it's incredible how many of those were lesbian. I, I don't know if the readers were primarily lesbian or, or straight men just trying to uh, figure out what that was all about. But uh, so I, I, I read them faithfully in the 50s and in the early 60s. But of course, they, they always ended with the lesbian either drowning in a well of loneliness or committing suicide or uh, something else terrible happening to her. And so um, when, when I realized I wanted to get a PhD, I, I thought, wow, I, I would love to write about about that, but um, I finished in 1967, and there was no way I could have written about that in 1967. By the early 70s, I realized I could, and I started writing in um, 1975, and uh, I think something like six articles were published in uh, 77 and 78. Um, but the reason it was so important to me is that and this is the only way, I guess, in which uh, my career is sort of like Harvey's. It, it was important to him to speak to young people uh, because he didn't have models when he was young. And it was important to me to, to write, at that time, lesbian history because there were no lesbian historians who wrote books that I wanted to read when I was young. And so that, that was kind of the beginning of my writing career. So I, I started with uh, several articles in the 1970s, and then uh, my book, Odd, uh, uh, Surpassing the Love of Men, came out in 1981. Um, but anyway, it, it's a long answer to your uh, question. But <laughs> OK, we have one last question in the front. So what inspired you to write about Harvey Milk? There's a lot of history to this, and it probably took a lot of time. Why, what made you so dedicated to this? Well, um, you know, I had written about him, as, as I said, um, in, uh, from my book, The Gay Revolution, that came out in, 19, in 2015. Uh, so I'd done a lot of research, and I, I knew there were things that Randy Schultz, who uh, wrote a wonderful book, I, I loved the mayor of Castro Street, but I knew there were things that he did not see, um, and I discovered them when I was doing research for uh, for the gay revolution. For instance, there's a, a terrific cache of letters uh, at the San Francisco Public Library that came available only within recent years um, that Harvey wrote to a young woman in Los Angeles, um, a straight young woman that he absolutely loved. They had this, this uh, wonderful friendship. She loved gay men. And from 1955 to about 1963, he poured his heart out to her. And so I had such insights into Harvey as a young person from the time he was 25 to uh, the time he was in his early 30s. So I, I knew then there, you know, there was a lot of material uh, that I could deal with that uh, Randy Schultz hadn't yet dealt with. I, I found another uh, wonderful collection of notes that he wrote Tom O'Horgan, uh, the director of Hair and uh, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, and, and they just gave me such insight into who Harvey was, how how important it was for him, for Tom to know. And, and Harvey had been a gopher for Tom O'Horgan on Broadway. How important it was for Harvey to know uh, that Tom O'Horgan knew that now Harvey was a success. It was just very, very touching letters. And of course, Randy Schultz hardly dealt with uh, how Harvey's Jewish past influenced him. And so knowing all of that, I realized that that, uh, that was something I, I wanted to do that, that hadn't been done yet, that Randy Schultz hadn't done in his terrific book. Thank you so much. Um, just a reminder, they'll be signing books in the back. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you.